Welcome to the Israel Bible Podcast. My name is Cindy Parker, and I am an author, speaker, and the professor of Holy Land Studies at Israel Bible Center. I am passionate about reading the Bible in the physical, historical, and cultural context of its day. And I love having these geeky conversations with people about new things. In this podcast, I'd like to invite you to join me as I sit down each week with other faculty members of IBC to discover new aspects of the Bible. These are some of my favorite dialogues because as a modern audience reading an ancient text, we know that the Bible does not need to be rewritten, but it needs to be reread. Once again, this week, I am mixing things up a bit. I invited Dr. Yeshaya Gruber to sit in the interviewer's seat here at the Israel Bible Podcast. Dr. Gruber is the professor of Jewish history and culture, But you may know him as the host of the brilliant roundtable talks at IBC, or maybe as the professor who very often hosts the Hot Topic seminars. We continue our conversations this week about my course, Listening to the Land of the Bible Part 2, which focuses solely on the early Second Temple period and the Gospels. What if we do start to try to get into those specifics a little bit? What kinds of things are we going to learn? For example, uh, you said, of course, Jesus is going to enter this type of a picture. Well, everyone knows he was born in Bethlehem in a stable because there was no room at the inn. Was Bethlehem like a big metropolis at this time with lots of uh, businessmen coming to visit? Why was there no room at the inn? What is If we try to apply this knowledge that we've gained, I mean, we haven't done it all in this brief discussion, but if people go to your course, they can gain a lot of knowledge about the context. If we then try to apply it, how can we look at a story like that, uh, Jesus being born in Bethlehem? I love this story, and I do spend a lot of time on it in the course, and so I'll just kind of skip through the details. So for the details, people have to sign up for the course, but there is so much culture involved in the birth narratives. And when we look at the birth narrative separately, so the Matthew version and the Luke version, in Luke, we're getting all kinds of things related to the agricultural calendar. Um, And we're actually seeing there is a presupposed understanding of what village life was like and the hospitality culture that influenced absolutely everything. And there's an assumption that we even understand what the homes look like. And so what is the inn, which is actually just a really bad translation of guest room, who's there? Why are so many people there? Why is there no room in the guest room so that Mary and Joseph have to go down to the area where the animals are? Why is it that the animals are outside instead of inside the house? Right. So these are all things that we kind of tease out in the course One of my all-time favorite conclusions, though, to this is once you understand what the real picture is that Luke is trying to explain in Luke chapter 2, what we end up seeing is Jesus born in a house with Mary, probably several midwives who are there helping out in a very full, like bursting at the seams house. So there's community, there's noise, there's loudness, and And you suddenly go, oh, right, like Jesus was born like normal babies are born into the middle of a messy family, into a normal life and into community. And for me, I think that is a so much more powerful way to look at and understand the reality of that story as opposed to this view of isolation that we normally have when we picture the birth narrative. We pictured like Mary and Joseph just out with no one, with no problems. And you just think that picture is a little absurd, right? Like a man, one man, and someone who has never had a baby before. Like that just doesn't make any sense to put them out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, and so it when we allow the background, the land, village life, village culture, and building to speak to us, we start to see and interpret the text in in new ways. And the birth narrative is just one of those that's very fun to talk about. 
So it really changes people's perception then. It makes you second guess a lot of Christmas carols, the lyrics in Christmas carols. Well, a while after Bethlehem, Jesus actually ended up growing up in Nazareth, in the Galilee. What are the pros and cons of growing up there? (laughs) Uh, Nazareth is such an interesting place. And again, this is all information you have to get by paying attention to the land and letting the land speak to you. Nazareth, we know, was a small village. How do we know this? Because on the ridge where the city was planted, where it began, um, the ancient core of Nazareth is any actually in this kind of chalky basin on the Nazareth ridge. And so the fact that the soil around Nazareth is fairly chalky instead of lush, beautiful, amazing, nutrient-rich soil is already telling us that the land is not able to support a large community. Um, the fact that there are not major springs. So we have a couple wells that are providing water. When we look at the quality of the soil and the access to fresh water, those two things in particular tell us that the village had to be quite small, that the land just can't support many people. But we also see that the village was started up on a hill. It's on not quite the crest line, but it's at the high part of a hill, which is going to tell us a few things. One, it's off the main road. Um, All the big major roads stay down inside the valleys because gravel is the easiest. And so we see that the people of Nazareth wanted to be out of the way. They wanted to be not quite on the international road. Um, And they're going to have to be a small community. But What we also see is, and this is where I go back, I'm always reminding people, land holds onto memory. And when you stand right outside Nazareth and you're in this elevated position and you're looking out around you, especially to the south, you're overlooking the Jezreel Valley. And the Jezreel Valley contains so many stories, Israelite stories, armies that are coming, Um, judges like Deborah and Gideon who are down in that valley. You have the death of King Saul is on the horizon line. Elijah fighting the prophets of Baal is on the horizon line. Then if we try to imagine these years that are not really explained to us of Jesus's growing up years, but if we put him in this very real place, we say, oh, he grew up in a pretty conservative village up out of the way, Um, away from the big major highways, but in view of a lot of his history that would have informed who he is or who he was and how he fit into the larger narrative of God interacting with God's people. That's a really dramatic difference from even Bethlehem further south in the hill country. And this is where you have to kind of activate your sacred imagination and just try to imagine what real life would have been like for people who grew up and lived in those kinds of communities. Well, growing up in a village like Nazareth, what do you think his schooling would have been like? The schooling aspect, it's interesting because I've read lots of different scholars who have lots of different ideas about it. The educational system was already very well established in Jewish communities. Education was always highly valued, even if we were to look back in the book of Deuteronomy. There's a constant call for parents to be constantly teaching their children about God and God's laws and God's teachings. Um, What we see happening prior to the time of Jesus, so in this early second temple period, is as synagogues are being developed and community life is congregating around the synagogue, there is a huge push during the Hasmonean time to establish um, education for all people, all kids in the villages, and it often happened in the synagogue. So we can, people have different ideas where there are two different versions, where there are three different levels of school or four different levels of school. It's a little bit blurry, but we would assume education would have been 
memorizing parts of the Torah. Um, the smallest kids would memorize Torah. But then I like to imagine, and again, I like to just kind of add on to all of that, the very rabbinic kind of discussion of questions and answers and thinking maybe Mary and Joseph or maybe some leading rabbis or maybe some elders of Nazareth, it wouldn't be all that far-fetched to imagine them with a group of kids standing on the ledge and then asking kids, what do you think about what we're supposed to learn from the conflict between Elijah and the prophets of Baal? What about our first king who united the tribes? What can we learn about leadership from Deborah? Uh, because all of that stuff is just on the horizon line and it makes their own history rich and real and full and not theoretical. Uh, and so I always imagine that as a really crucial part of education for kids that would have grown up in that area. Wow. So they would grow up infused with all of this biblical history, seeing yeah. it, hearing about it just yeah. as part of their normal day to day life. You do have a lot more in the course and in the book on education, on what it meant to be a rabbi or a teacher and a disciple in this time period. In the course and in your book also, you do have a lot more on education and, you know, what it meant to be a teacher, uh, a dis disciple, even an adult disciple. I'll let people discover that for themselves when they sign up. So if people explore your course or your book, or both, they can find out a lot more about education. They can find out about what is a rabbi, you know, a teacher who might have traveled around with disciples, why a disciple would leave everything to follow a teacher. That's pretty strange to us in our modern world, but it was common back then, or at least very well understood. And in addition, you talk a lot about men and women and their different roles and uh, what was going on in that society. I think it's so fascinating that Queen Salome played a role in establishing the educational system. And you describe that and what it would have been like for girls and for boys. Um, but maybe we'll let people discover that for themselves once they sign up. I just wonder, because I have walked around in those hills of Galilee outside Nazareth, as have many people. And, and when you read the stories, it seems like a lot of the narrative takes place there, kind of maybe on the go, moving in those hills. How might that have influenced the teaching style or the speaking style that we read about, or at least we have some sort of version of what was going on, some condensed version, selected excerpts of what was going on in those Galilean hills? Yeah, it is another fun concept to be thinking about when you're physically there, because when you're physically there, you begin to understand, oh, when Jesus, even when he goes to Cana for the first miracle, the turning the water into wine, Cana, um, you start to go, oh, I see, I see where Cana is in relation to where Nazareth is, where Jesus grew up. And you begin to see how much time it would have taken to cross the Natova Valley to get over to where Cana is, um, or how long it would take to walk to Capernaum, say, which is where basing his ministry. And so all of a sudden you start to go, oh, there's all these in-between times, right? We, we read these stories where in one verse they're in Capernaum, say, and then in the very next verse they're in Nazareth. And we forget that they had to get there. And those traveling times are really good teaching times. And I love to kind of set students out on a walk to then say, what are you doing as you're traveling from this point to another point? What are you talking about? And Usually it's people kind of going over what we've already learned that day or they're telling jokes or they're getting to know each other. And it's all of these things helps us better imagine when Jesus is walking with his crowd of admirers, you know, the, the 12 disciples, but then also all the women that would have been following him and others that would have been traveling with him. It allows us to then think through what were those in-between times like and and then we begin to see, oh, right, he was out in the middle of agricultural fields. Of course, he's going to use agricultural imagery as he's teaching. 
Or, of course, they're walking right by one of the areas where Herod Antipas is building a tower. Of course, he's going to make reference to Herod Antipas and to this tower. They become objects on the immediate landscape that become very easy to point to, to be the example of the teaching he's trying to get across to people. And so I think the, again, becoming familiar with the land, becoming familiar with the history, what was happening during those days, it just helps you imagine or understand how Jesus is communicating so brilliantly with a very diverse group of people that would have been in the crowds. It just strikes me that teaching, in the way you're describing it, is so tied to daily life and the real physical environment and, you know, how to live in a practical sense. Today, when we think of education, especially, say, higher degrees, we might think of something that's very remote from practical or daily life. But these rabbis, they were teaching people about how they believed someone should live in a very complex environment, in a very challenging situation. You mentioned, for example, the empires. What By the time of Jesus, does it get any simpler? There's the Roman Empire then. So is everything just one power and it's all uniform by that point? Or is it still complicated? It is massively complicated even though it is, it, everything falls under the Roman Empire. And when Herod the Great dies, and Herod the Great, the one we now call Herod the Great, is the Herod of the birth narratives. But then after that, we have all kinds of other Herods that show up, and they're sons and grandsons of Herod the Great. But when Herod dies, his parcel of land that Rome is allowing him to rule over gets further divided between his sons. And then one of his sons gets excommunicated, gets taken away. Um, and then Roman governors come in. And so that also is going to change politics. It changes the complexity of where Jesus, the disciples, and everyone else living in that land during the first century what they're dealing with because Herod Antipas ruled the areas of Galilee and Perea in a very different way than his brother Herod Philip ruled, uh, which was very different than the way that Roman governors ruled and Roman governors, Judea and Samaria and Idumea. So these are all very small parcels of land and you can walk from one area to another area um, and you can do that in a day. You can do that in a couple days. If you're living around the Sea of Galilee, you have three different political units that are all sharing the shoreline of a very small freshwater lake. And so that is going to influence the context that people are living in. Even how fishermen, say, are fishing. You know, if they are fishermen like Peter and several of the disciples were fishermen. And they're good Jewish men who are going to be eating kosher. But fishing is such a tedious and really difficult job. And you go, well, so what did they do when they pull their catch out of the Sea of Galilee and they go to shore? They have to separate kosher and non-kosher fish, right? Like, what do they do with the non-kosher fish? Well, they don't throw it back into the lake. That would be absolutely ridiculous. It would be wasted time on the lake. But, you know, just a couple miles away is the area of the Decapolis and the people in the Decapolis will eat anything. So you can just sell the non-kosher fish to them. You know, they're eating swine. They have pork everywhere, like herds of pigs that are on the hillside. They'll eat the non-kosher fish. So it just helps us again, kind of understand how people are are living and interacting with each other at this time. Hmm. I even seem to remember herds of pigs or swine coming into the narrative at some point. You know, you describe in your course and in your book some of the things that made Jesus such an effective communicator, remarkable ability to just cut to the heart of the issue and reveal things to people in images that they could understand. But didn't he sometimes contradict himself? I'm thinking in particular about that one pair of incidents that you highlight, which says that, you know, in one case, he 
he did a remarkable healing or miracle and then said, go and tell everyone about it. Yeah. And in another case, he did something very similar, but he told the people, don't tell anyone about it. Yeah. I mean, was he sort of bouncing back and forth between extremes or what's going on here? That is a, another great question that understanding land and politics can illuminate for us and help us explain it so much better. This happens quite a bit when we when we look at the area around Galilee. Let's just do that because we were just talking about the area around Galilee and the Sea of Galilee in particular. So three different political units around the sea. One of them is the Decapolis, had a very pagan mindset. One was Golanitis, and it had a very mixed entity of people. There were zealots there. There were small Jewish villages, massive, huge Roman cities that were there. And then we have the political region of Galilee, which by and large in big brushstrokes held very tightly onto their Jewish Israelite roots. So we find, like, even if we just map that out, if we just look at where they are and then pay attention to where Jesus is, when he is in Galilee, so he's in very Jewish-minded people who have scripture-soaked minds, right? They understand their scripture. When he is in places like that and he heals people, that is where he says, don't go tell anyone, be quiet, or go to the priest, show yourself to the priest, uh, but don't spread the word. But then when he's just up okay, and he's over in the area of the Decapolis, say, um, for instance, since we brought up swine, the story of Jesus casting demons out of a man and they go into a, a herd of pigs. He goes and tells that man, go tell everyone. And this is where that confusing bit comes in. Why, why tell some people to keep it quiet and some people to go? And you think, well, in the Decapolis, there's no one in the Decapolis who is anticipating a Messiah. There is no one in the Decapolis that thinks anyone is going to overthrow Rome. There's no political undercurrent of the potential of a zealot kind of raising up a, a group of people to overthrow or to try to do something as ridiculous as overthrow Rome. And so in that kind of context, Jesus can show his power. And then he says, go tell everyone what you have seen. Now, on the other hand, people who are over in Galilee, because of their scripture soaked minds, they are thinking, are we going to have a king like David? Is there a Messiah who is coming? Someone is going to, like the Maccabees a couple generations before, someone is going to come and overthrow the empire. And when Jesus performs miracles, people are looking at him thinking, maybe you're that kind of leader that we've been anticipating. And in those cases, Jesus says, don't tell anyone what's going on because he's trying to show a different version of being Messiah than what it is that they're anticipating. And so it's all about who is Jesus talking to and where is he when he's doing that teaching? And if we just do that little bit of homework, we can, we can see a little bit more of what is actually happening in, in these events. And we cover several of these kinds of stories in the course. And you can really hone in on, I think, the similarities and the differences to the people that must have been surrounding Jesus as he walked through these various narratives. That's something you point out too. Very often people think that he's opposed to the local culture in a particular incident, and it turns out to be the other way around, and perhaps vice versa. Uh, you talk about how he wasn't the first one to come and claim to be the Messiah, the Deliverer, which is very interesting and important to know, important to understand for the context. So I don't know, is there anything in particular you'd like to add to give a nice spicy example before we close? There are just so many examples, but I'll say another one because this is another favorite one for me is, and again, in the course, we spent a lot more time walking through the specifics of it, but I'll just give the big picture version here. In Matthew 16, Jesus is, has been hanging around the Sea of Galilee. He's been in the region of Galilee. They've been kind of hanging out in the area they normally do. And Matthew 16 says, for some, whatever reason, but there's a purposefulness to 
Jesus taking his group of followers up to Caesarea Philippi. And it is in Caesarea Philippi that Jesus starts asking questions like, who do people say that I am? And who do you, people who have followed, been following me for years, who do you say that I am? And in the course and in the book, I like to highlight why, what happens when you have that conversation in the area of Caesarea Philippi? What is it about Caesarea Philippi that provides the right kind of backdrop for that conversation. And it does in lots of different ways, but one of the big reasons is Caesarea Philippi was built to be a city that emulates everything that Rome values. This, the worship of Caesar, the building of monuments, the polytheistic nature of worship, the the common people honoring the person at the top, this pyramid structure of leadership, division between the elite and the poor. Caesarea Philippi mimics all of that, or not mimics it, Caesarea Philippi displays that grandly, what the values of Rome are. And so in that context, Jesus stands with his followers and says, my version the version of God's kingdom is totally different because in my version, I am going to go and die. In my version, I'm going to serve you in a different way. And so Caesarea Philippi becomes the perfect backdrop between the comparison on how does God want to structure his kingdom and what the role or how Jesus understood his role as Messiah playing into that versus what this human culture is all about, how humans like to honor themselves. And when you put that conversation against the proper backdrop, it makes the conversation so much more brilliant. There's like little fireworks going on all over the place in Matthew 16. And I think it's just really brilliant. Wow. I mean, I'll go back to what I said before. When you think about it, when you hear it that way, it sounds so obvious and yet I'd be willing to bet that most readers have never thought of it that way, have never thought about the connection between the specific geographical setting, the particular city or hill or what have you, and how that relates to the story and the message and what's being communicated. You know, I'll get in a plug for the roundtable talks too, if that's okay. Please do. Because oh, I yes. have a roundtable talk with Professor Israel Knoll of the Hebrew University of Jerusalem who talks a lot about different views of the Messiah in the Jewish world in the time period before or leading up to Jesus. And he has some really interesting theories. And he also brings in a lot of things that other people haven't thought of. So if you put that together with what Professor Parker is telling you, you are going to have an amazing new way to look at all of these things. And that's just a sample of the resources we offer at Israel Bible Center. But... I should offer this warning, and this comes from uh, another blurb on your book, uh, where it says, I'll paraphrase, if you don't want to have your Western colloquial caricatures of Jesus dismantled, don't take this course. <laughs> but if you're willing to try, you should run out to get the book, read it, sign up to take the course with the author, hear directly from her. It's very enlightening. She's so enthusiastic. She explains everything so well. It's very engaging. And you can ask her questions. So I don't see any reason for anyone not to sign up for this. And I'll help you get addicted to maps and geography and texture. And we have lots of pictures that we show. So it's, it is quite an interactive, very vibrant sort of a course. But thank you, Dr. Gruber, for that plug and those very kind words. Dr. Parker, Cindy, thank you so much. This has been a lot of fun. And I My can't pleasure. recommend uh, these resources highly enough, the book and the course. L what are they called again? Listening to the Land of the Bible Part 2, in case anyone didn't write it down. And... Encountering Jesus in the Real World of the Gospels. Imagination is good, but if you can also find out what's going on in reality, that's even better. Ah, stated perfectly, Dr. Gruber. 
Thank you for joining us this week. Links for everything we've talked about are in the show notes, including a link if you'd like to sign up for Israel Bible Center Certificate Program in Jewish Context and Culture. That will give you access to all of our courses, all of the roundtable talks, and all of the Hot Topic seminars. You can find us on the web at israelbiblecenter.com, or even easier, just click on the link in the notes at the bottom of this episode. Thank you to Jeremy McDonald with Mason Jar Music for mixing, editing, and crafting all the good sounds you hear. And thank you for being curious about the world of the Bible. 